Our next DevOps stalwart began his career as a research scientist at Xerox PARC, where he built the first aspect-oriented development environment. He then pioneered the integration of development environments with Agile and DevOps tools while working on his computer science PhD side-by-side -side at the University of British Columbia. Founding his company TaskTop as a result of that research, he has written over 1 million lines of open source code that are still in use today. Apart from donning the hat of CEO of TaskTop, he is also the best-selling author of Project to Product, How to Survive and Thrive in the Age of Digital Disruption with the Flow Framework. It's now time to deep dive straight into another interesting conversation with our keynote speaker on how do we measure digital transformation and thrive in the age of digital disruption with the Flow Framework. Ladies and gentlemen, we bring to you Dr. Mick Kirsten. Hello, everyone. My name is Mick Kirsten. I'm the founder and CEO of TASTOP and the author of Project the Product. And it's great to be speaking at DevOps Summit India. And today I'm going to be talking to you about measuring digital transformation with the Flow Framework. So I've seen just a ton of interest uh, over the past several years in terms of organizations wanting to know how to more effectively measure the outcomes of their DevOps transformations, of all the effort that they're putting into uh, better engineering and development practices, better agile practices. And what I've really learned over the course of that journey is that it's how fundamentally challenging it has been for organizations to actually found, find these meaningful measures. So I spent a decade trying to do this myself, uh, understanding how to measure the productivity of open source, doing the work in my PhD thesis to, to really get a sense for how to measure the productivity productivity of first of individual developers, especially when we look at that productivity, not just as cutting lines of code, but really looking at end-to-end -end delivery of value. So really software value streams. From that, I came up with this notion of the flow framework and really capture that in the book, Project to Product, which summarizes why it's so important to understand our product value st streams, understand how value streams are delivering value to a customer. Every product fundamentally has a customer uh, and really how to measure improvements of value and in ways that impact the customer, the business, in, in ways that impact the flow that and focus and joy uh, to channel Gene Kim's unicorn project that our, that our software and our teams can deliver. So fundamentally, the frustration for me came from the fact that I was working with many technology leaders and many business leaders who were overseeing uh, technology, large technology, let's just let's be fair and call them projects. And I would ask them, so, in terms of your transformation, what bottleneck are you focused on? Uh, are you is your bottleneck in your continuous delivery pipeline, or is or is it maybe is it upstream of the pipeline? Uh, is it downstream? Do you have problems with your, your security review practices and the like? And I realized that no one really had a consistent answer to that. So there was not a a consistent, reliable view of where work would stall. And fundamentally, if we actually looked deeply into the principles of DevOps, those those principles of um, of flow and feedback and continual learning, uh, we understand that applying the, the concepts of Lean, such as the theory of constraint, really means we need to always understand how work is flowing, make sure that that work is visible, and then understand exactly where things are getting stuck. Those places that, that things get stuck is the places where our teams get frustrated, is the place, those are the places that prevent us from delivering value to the customer. And as you'll see in this presentation, they can come from these various flow uh, challenges and flow problems, uh, that have to do with things like too much work in progress or problematic software architectures, lack of locality and the like. But the thing that really struck me was that organizations simply did not have a clear sense of where their bottlenecks were. So when we were looking at these large DevOps transformations, it wasn't actually clear whether they were addressing the bottleneck. It wasn't clear whether the focus was going to the right place. And of course, the even as you can see from this diagram, the challenge is that you've got a very complex software portfolio. You might have one bottleneck for one particular value stream and a, and a different one for, for another value stream. So these you know, one-size-fits-all initiatives and transformations often simply weren't delivering the kind of results that organizations needed, that teams needed to become more productive. So 
the, I'll give you just uh, one simple example over here. This was uh, an organization that we work with. This was actually presented at the DevOps Empire Summit a few years ago. And when I was working with the CIO and his team, he was curious how long it was taking to deliver value to the customers. And of course, they had put in place some of the uh, typical DevOps metrics, such as the Dora metrics. So they're getting, they had a sense for other uh, change success rate. They had a change for the code commit to code deploy time. But fundamentally, what the CIO was noticing is that he was not, he was, he had business partners and customers who were still not happy with how quickly value being, was being delivered. So we measured this. Uh, we used our tools and we measured across a couple hundred value streams what the average time was to get value to customers. But keep in mind that uh, in terms of the flow framework and project to product thinking, this is all about taking the, the customer's point of view and looking at the end-to-end -end value stream, not just a segment of the value stream, not just how long it takes developers to close out a user story, not just how long it takes to go from code commit to code deploy, but the, the entire end-to-end -end value stream. And it turned out that it was taking 120 days. So with this, uh, the CIO, the states thought, okay, well, this is this is much too long. We can't innovate fast enough. Uh, we've already had our a lot of our DevOps efforts underway. Clearly, we need we need to really uh, bring on board many more developers, and we must be constrained on development. And so we said, oh, hang on a second. Let's take a look at how things actually flow through those value streams. And what we noticed that was that only two and a half percent of the active work time on uh, basically on the, what teams were working on, on, on the flow items was spent in development. And the rest was basically being blocked by, in this case, actually, uh, many upstream bottlenecks and constraints. Of course, they were different for different value streams. The key thing with bottlenecks is at any particular point, you, you only have one, you leave that one, and then you find the other. But the key thing was that there were too many constraints. There were, in this case, there were actually too few UX designers. There were too many approval processes that were happening and actually hiring many more developers. Imagine you can just do overnight double the count of developers on this value stream. You would still have no more throughput because that's not where your constraint was. And really, that's why I realized it was just so important that we had a, a, a very accurate and reliable and meaningful way of measuring end-to-end -end flow, that it wasn't enough for us to now only focus on, on small portions of the value stream to understand flow. For example, to focus on these cycle time segments where, where so many teams are focused on because it, those cycle times are very meaningful to the team. They're very meaningful in terms of how long you're doing business analysis or design, how long development's taking, how long release management operations and like are taking. But we really, with the flow metrics and the whole goal of the project shift from project to product and the flow framework is to make it easy and to focus on these end-to-end -end measurements that really represent the customer's point of view. And that's really what flow time is. And I'll get into these flow metrics in more detail in a moment. But the whole goal is that rather than just having our our development teams and our operations team collaborate in this flow mentality, we actually have the entire organization working towards flow. So there's this, again, we're focusing on flow time. So the end-to-end -end time to bring value to a customer uh, across all of the teams on the value stream. Value streams are typically made up of between one and 10 teams. Uh, and they can be organized as feature teams. They can be organized according to the, the various great practices put forth by team topologies. But the bottom line is, is if you've got waterfall bookends, on the processes by, you know, by basically constraining the teams from how much value they deliver, uh, you're actually not living the principles of agility of DevOps. And the whole goal, and as you'll see, the, the key reason for measuring this end-to-end -end flow time uh, and the other flow metrics is to make sure that the entire software delivery process, the entire decision-making and planning process around software has this flow orientation rather than this water scrum follows waterfall orientation. Uh, and to do that, of course, we need basically visibility and feedback into our planning systems that provides us a direct connection between the business and the customer and technology. If we have these layers of indirection, if we're only looking at uh, technology invest uh, technology as, as costs rather than as investments and as, as, as profit centers, if we're only tracking activities through uh, project management rather than getting direct feedback on the value of what is being delivered, uh, the rate at what's being delivered and where the constraints are, again, we're falling back to the practices of project management rather than actually applying the practices of DevOps at scale for our entire organization. So uh, to really to do that, we need to at a, at a whole company at an organization level, understand what flows in software delivery. And of course, uh, teams tend to know that, right? Teams working day-to-day -day on their backlogs, on resolving incidents, on providing 
uh, really cool and interesting features to customers, they have a sense for that. But the challenge is, is that we've not had uh, a common way of looking across the entire organization at a higher level. So not at the, not at the technical level, but uh, at the higher level and abstracting over what flows in software delivery. And so the flow framework, and one of my goals for this talk, by the way, is just to give you a, a high level overview of the, of the flow framework, and especially these flow metrics, the flow metrics portion of the flow framework. So you can understand that uh, measuring this will help support both your teams and your organization. And again, help you elevate these, these principles of business agility and DevOps uh, to, to how you innovate and how you build software. So to do that, and by the way, my own background with this uh, really came from uh, trying to measure software productivity as part of my PhD thesis and as part of a open source project and then studying large enterprise organizations to understand again at that higher level what what value do they deliver and if we think of lean concepts value delivery is all about pull so it's not about activities that you do it's about the value that's derived by a customer from the activities from those activities so the flow framework introduces just four flow items and this is really the core of it their features those are net new business value, and those are pulled by the customer. So customers don't pull releases. Customers really don't, unless you're only releasing, re releasing very infrequently, customers don't care about, what's in the, about how often you release. Customers care about the value that is in the release, how much net new value that you deliver to them through that release. And so fundamentally, features are this, are this key thing that's pulled by the customer. Defects. Uh, defects are quality improvements, and those are pulled, also pulled by the customer. So basically, the fewer defects, the fewer incidents, the fewer outages that a particular product or service has, of course, the better experience, the better re the retention rates. Similarly, the more features that you're delivering, the more that should drive active usage and revenue and conversions and those other key business metrics. Uh, then the flow framework makes risks a first class part of software delivery. And so the ris those risks are data privacy, compliance, uh, security, and the like, where, of course, we need to keep a balance on those because those in the end are critical both to the business as a whole and fundamentally to the customer as well to avoid things like data breaches and debts. The flow framework makes debt, so that's, that's organizational debt, technical debt, process debt, a first class flow item. The more that we resolve those debts, the more we should be able to improve future flow and to make sure that we're building platforms that support our, our organization in the future. So the key thing with these four flow items is they're MISI, and that stands for mutually exclusive and comprehensive exhaustive. And so this means that in each value stream, if we're looking at the balance or the, what's called the flow distribution of these, uh, the more we do of one, the less we do of another. So the more features that we deliver, the less technical debt we'll actually have a chance to resolve. Uh, if a particular release just either went through a, 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 or a particular part of your software portfolio just went through an audit, uh, just went through a compliance review, you might have a lot of risk work that has to get done in that release cycle. And of course, that's going to affect your ability to fix defects or to, to deliver more features. So with this lens, we're actually able to inspect every value stream and to understand whether what's being delivered, what's being planned, actually aligns to, the, to, to the, our goals for the customer and for the business. So the key thing is with these four flow items in mind is the thing that flow through our value streams. Uh, we need some kind of vital signs. We need some way of detecting, is this value stream healthy or does it have problems? And I'll show you some examples of, of, of actually of both. So, these value stream flow metrics are what gives us that way of inspecting and a very simple way of inspecting those value streams. So let's quickly go through the flow metrics in the flow framework. And the first one is flow velocity. So flow velocity is simply end to end the amount of flow items that were completed. So the amount of features, defects, risks, and debt that you completed over a particular window of time. And the flow framework, keep in mind, is at a higher level. So it discards things like story points. You might want to see how many story points were completed. You simply then go down from the flow framework into the particular agile tool or methodology that you're using. At this higher level, because we tend to have very large numbers of flow items, uh, we actually simply count the number of flow items that were completed over that unit of time to understand how much, what, what the balance uh, of each was delivered and how much was delivered over that sprint, uh, that uh, release, that quarter of the fiscal year, and so on. So the next uh, item that we have is flow efficiency. And if you think back to, to my point about bottlenecks, flow efficiency is our bottleneck detector. It shows us exactly where the active states versus the wait states are. And wait states are the, basically the, they're the kiss of death on value streams. They're the things that frustrates us. They're the things that are the external dependencies uh, from our team that really keeps us from getting work done. And so 
of flow efficiency shows you that ratio and actually will show you where those wait states are happening if you zoom in and you see where the longest wait states are. Uh, flow time is the end-to-end -end time to, uh, to market, time to value from when work entered the value stream. So when work started uh, and flow time should start when basically any human starts working on a particular flow item. So that could be in the design and analysis phase as well to when work is finished and work will be finished when uh, that it's basically been validated and and uh, in the sense that it'll cont it'll uh, you've got running software in the customer's hands or it's been validated as something that you're not going to deliver. For example, you you realize there was an experiment and it does not need to get done. So you simply define uh, the flow time start and the flow time end for your value stream, and then you've actually got this view, view from the customer of how much was delivered when, and actually all, importantly, which work was also canceled. And then uh, finally, we've got flow load. So flow load is the amount of the, it's basically the amount of work in progress or WIP that's on the value stream. And so what we notice, what you'll see in some of the examples I give you is that when flow load gets too high, flow velocity actually goes down because we overload our teams. Uh, we put too much cognitive load on what teams can do. We, we cause too much context switching. And flow load is this really key metric to understand the health of your value streams as well. And then flow distribution uh, is not a metric, it's a distribution. It's simply that ratio of features, defects, risks, and debts. And of course, we can apply these other flow metrics to it. We can see, OK, what is the flow velocity um, of, our, of our feature work? Uh, how many are we delivering? And how can we improve that delivery by removing bottlenecks? Or what is the flow time of, of basically security fixes so that we understand how whether we, we've got enough support uh, enough framework supporting those security fixes to make it easy for our teams to implement those. So uh, the whole the way that all of this works, by the way, in the flow framework is that this data is all there. It, it's there today. So this data is actually in the tool network in the way that development, operations, support, design, uh, product management, project management teams, the way everyone's working is being captured in a large number of very rich tools. Uh, all those tools have very rich issue types and workflow models and the like. And on top of that, we simply need to model the product value streams, model the flow items and the flow states, and then we can actually then measure the flow distribution as well as, as the flow metrics. And very importantly, we can then, uh, in the top right of the flow framework, connect those and correlate them to business results. For example, did delivering more features uh, improve the net promoter score of a particular um, uh, of, a, of a particular, say, mobile application or web application that you've got? Uh, did investing in uh, tech debt reduction and how you're using, let's say, cloud storage services, did that reduce the cost of the, the hosting cost of this particular value stream? The key thing is that these, these flow metrics make this, this very dynamic and complex system of software value streams explicit and then show you, for example, where things like the wait states are. And the wait states will often, as you'll see from the middle of the flow framework, come from, from various dependencies that you might have uh, between different value streams. So let's now jump into a diagnosis. This is a, we'll have a little kind of a medical diagnosis team here of looking at the charts of a patient and, and looking at their, and their flow metrics and how, how we're doing. And uh, the patient in this case is a financial services company. Uh, their history is that they've had this uh, very successful agile rollout. So they, you know, they've deployed um, uh, the, uh, the scaled agile framework in terms of being able to, to uh, track some of their work and really plan it and connect some of, create some of that organizational connectivity to, uh, to the business to really elevate just, you know, from team level agility to business agility. They've also had some very impressive investment. It's actually the kind of exemplary investment in their CI and CD pipeline and the DevOps practices. So they've got some excellent automation. Of course, this is always a journey. DevOps is always a journey. You're, you're looking at uh, additional automations as things get more complex, uh, rolling that out more broadly in the organization. But they've actually done, uh, done quite well, especially compared to many of the other organizations I've worked with on this front. However, even with those two things in place, basically uh, you know, a lot of success on the agile and on the DevOps front, uh, the, the, the consensus really is along the, a lot of the technology leadership team is that feature delivery is still painfully slow. They've done all this, but it seems like features not being delivered to customers and to business partners quickly enough. And the business is just frankly concerned about a lack of innovation, that you've got these uh, fintech and insured tech startups that seem to be moving much faster than this particular organization. So let's take a look now at this patient's charts. And these are like, you know, think of these as the medical charts. Uh, we're able to capture these at, with, our, with our tools at TASTOP. 
Uh, and then you'll see what you're seeing is these, these visualizations of the flow metrics. And what, what we see over here, and this is the flow distribution chart. We don't have to get into too much details on these charts, but what you see here is there's, there's just not enough green. Green is those features that customers pull. Green, are, green is the features that delight customers because they make them easier for them to get accounts and to log in and to have a great experience uh, managing the financial products and the like. So uh, we see that the business, we, we now see from these charts immediately why the business is concerned because feature delivery is, is low and there's a lot of, so much of the value chain's capacity is going to defect delivery. And you know, frankly, what this means is this, this, does not, this is not the kind of chart that you see for uh, a value stream that's, that's really innovating because the more green, the more innovation. So now let's take another look. And this is the flow load chart. So flow load is the, again, it's the whip, it's the work in progress. And we see two really interesting things here. We see that the dark green uh, is the amount of concurrent work that's happening. So this is, like, and keep in mind, the value streams are at the team of teams level. So we're looking across uh, multiple, I think in this case, six or seven different agile teams. And they're working on, all, and we're just looking at features right now. We just, we just zoomed into features, which is again, where we're seeing the, some of the, 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 the flow problems. So what's happening is the teams are working on a lot concurrently. And even more interestingly, their backlogs are just rising and rising. And if we uh, squint over here, uh, we see that this is a really significant problem because the flow efficiency is just going down. So as you basically, this is just one of the most common patterns that we see as work in progress goes up, flow efficiency goes down, flow velocity for features is going down. And so we have a really serious problem. And the flow metrics are making this problem very clear that this is unsustainable, that, that this is just going to get worse before it gets better. So let's take a look at what's causing those bottlenecks. And in this case, we're going to click this analyze load button. And if we squint even harder here, uh, what we see is that there's this outlier in terms of, in terms of how work is flowing. Uh, what we are seeing here right now is that some of the key problems are showing up in the, in the JIRA tool. And whichever tool you're using for your agile planning will, of course, often highlight some of the bottlenecks. It, could also be highlighted in your in your service desk. They could be you know they could be coming from your uh, requirements management or your product management or, or your uh, project management tools. But in this case, we're seeing that something interesting is happening because there are seventy three user stories stuck in something called core backend services. And of course, the teams know what core backend services is because when you've got seventy three things stuck there, you're getting quite annoyed that they're all getting stuck there, and that they're preventing you, who might be working on the mobile or the web applications or something else that depends on core backend services, uh, uh, you know, some reporting application or something of that sort. Uh, you're, you you've already felt like you're always stuck on this core backend services because core backend services is the bottleneck. We're seeing here the data, the flow data, and the wait states that we've collected are showing that this is the bottleneck. Uh, and so what this data now enables, of course, is an organizational focus on the bottleneck. Previously, what was happening is the focus was going elsewhere. Core backend services was never getting enough people. Uh, contractors were shifting in and out of it. And so it remained the bottleneck while the other teams were just expected to go faster and get their work done. But again, what the flow data shows us is that this is kind of the equivalent of the Suez Canal. Until you address this problem, nothing in the system will, will move faster because this is the constraint. And you know, it's always slightly ironic when I see this because, of course, a number of the people in the room when we were looking at live at these flow diagnostics, they, they knew this was the constraint. But finally, they had the hard data to show that and to show that basically the current efforts could not continue without addressing that constraint, or at least you couldn't expect results to be any different and, and work to speed up. So this is what we call the tech that death spiral uh, diagnostic. And this is really when we're seeing work go from you know, basically a crawl to a standstill. So we see that feature flow time is increasing, feature flow velocity is decreasing. Flow dis oh, by the way, I, one thing I didn't mention, uh, the flow distribution of technical debt was invisible. And this was one of the key problems. They had features, uh, uh, defects, and risks, but, but uh, work was not made visible for, uh, for tech debt. And so, this was actually you know, already a sign because if tech that's not visible, either, either you managing tech debt or it's managing you. And clearly it was managing them because all of this tech debt was in core backend services that was not being addressed in any meaningful way. Uh, and so when this happens also, we do see the flow distributions of defects increasing. 
So the business symptoms of, from this are that time to market is unacceptably low because, of course, it's taking too long to get features done. The cost of delay, so not bringing those features to market, grows and grows and affects the business more and more. Uh, internally, team happiness decreases because all that, all those wait states, all that frustration is a problem. And then that actually gets very difficult to onboard new staff and new hires onto basically onto architectures this tangle that have these kinds of problematic dependencies. Now, the mistreatments here are unsustainable work and heroics, just telling the teams to get more done, to hit those deadlines and the like. Again, it's, it's, a, it's a losing battle because we're not helping the teams by addressing the constraint. We're just putting more work on them, and that work is getting blocked for the same, same reasons. Uh, adding development headcount to business applications doesn't work. It's like trying to stuff more, you know, more ships through a, through a clogged or a blocked Suez Canal. Um, and then in this case, the lowest cost going to the back end. And the, uh, in that constraint had the lowest cost going to it. It had contractors who, again, were getting shifted in and out. And it was, this was just exacerbating the, the constraint. So in terms of the treatment plan that worked for this organization, that made things better, number one was actually making all tech that work visible, celebrating that tech debt. If someone actually made a, a small incremental API that some of the business applications could start calling instead of going to core backend services, and that legacy API, well, that should be celebrated, right? Um, so we want to elevate and celebrate tech debt. Uh, we also want to get very disciplined and, in the end, kind of scientific about um, uh, about investments in tech debt by measuring the results. So if you invest in tech debt and adding APIs, well, that should improve flow time. And that's exactly what you measure. So basically, as you add those APIs, uh, as you refactor and re-architect some of your platforms, uh, you measure the increases in flow time, and you finally have a way of measuring the outcome of tech debt investment. And in this case, they did need to make some organizational structure changes. By the way, without investing in a whole new team, they simply had to bring some of the existing teams onto those core backend services to accelerate some of this work, which then of course had the effect of making everything else move much faster. And then the key thing is not just to stop there, right? This is, and this is, uh, I think one of the frustrations I've seen is that there's a hypothesis on what's wrong and then we fix it and, and, and you think you're done. Well, you're not done. There's this almost, uh, if you're familiar with the game, the whack-a-mole where these bottlenecks, you fix one and then you've got the next one to fix. And that's, uh, uh, we should actually take pride in fixing and the continuous improvement that's needed to fix those bottlenecks. Because what we wanna do is we don't wanna stop there. We just got an improvement of flow time by adding an API over here. Uh, well, then we want to get the next one. And so basically, the most important thing and the most effective thing I've found is to make measuring the flow metrics a part of your regular planning process. Make it, if you're using SAFE, make it a part of your PI process. Uh, if you're using, um, uh, if you're using kind of any sort of iterative or agile planning, if you're using OKRs, have an OKR on flow efficiency or flow time improvements, because it'll actually help you create the experiments uh, and the, the, uh, uh, implement the experiments and then measure the outcomes in terms of how flow time improved. And you'll also see these other effects on the value streams. You should see fewer defects in flow distribution. Tech that actually will reduce defects. And one of the key ones is, and one of the key uh, metrics in the flow framework is actually happiness. The staff of happiness should increase because you've got more focus, flow, and joy from that locality and simplicity that we see. Uh, and again, here, setting the unicorn project. So uh, the, the, the CIO of this organization actually said, that this, this was the SV, actually the SVP um, of technology, your bottlenecks just stare you in the face. They wave at you, and sometimes to add insult to injury, once you start looking at those flow metrics, and of course you can do something about them and then measure the result. All right. So now let's switch to the next one. And the tech that death spiral is, I think, one of the, you know, the most concerning uh, for di diagnostics that we see. Uh, neglected WIP is actually the most common one that we see across all of the deployments of the flow framework that we've had over the past few years. So this, in this case, the patient is a healthcare company, um, again, doing agile at scale. And they, interestingly, as you'll see from these flow diagnostics, they've actually been championing tech debt. Great to see. However, the ailments are that IT can't keep up with the business. So let's take a look at what's going on here. And when we look at this patient's charts, what we see is uh, that there, the purple, by the way, in the in the task of this charts that we're using here to analyze the data, um, the purple is the tech debt investment. And what we see is that there's substantial tech debt investment. However, if we look at the flow load, the flow load is much higher than the, than the velocity. So we're able to run these analytics and actually use Little's law and queuing theory to determine, well, how the work coming in, the flow load, the WIP, 
How does it match the actual real capacity of the teams? And here it does not match, which means queues will just get longer and things will just slow down. Uh, so when that happens, flow efficiency starts going down and lower and lower and lower. And this can be extremely problematic. We've seen organizations where so much load is put onto teams, this actually got exacerbated through COVID in, in some cases, uh, that flow efficiency went down to 1%. So basically almost nothing is getting done and there's all this overload and all this thrashing. Uh, the way through this is it's, it's actually critical to get through this. And oftentimes the teams themselves can't get through it, right? There is no process improvement or, or the next CI, CD automation that you can make that'll get you through this. This actually involves a discussion with the business and the prioritization and showing the numbers is that the ratio of our capacity to what's coming in, the flow load, is completely unsustainable. Putting in place those whip limits, just reducing the amount of work in progress. And here you see one of Dominica, the grandest time thieves, the, uh, the whip time thief. Uh, simply reducing the work in progress will improve velocity. And again, we can go back to queuing theory and Lil's Law on this. But the key thing is to observe this and to understand it, because again, this is the number one most common dysfunction that we see with enterprise. The flow symptoms are flow load is going up, flow efficiency is dropping. Uh, the business symptoms are that feature work seems to wait indefinitely because the teams are getting less and less done. Um, you're losing credibility with customers because, of course, you need those features. Those, those were all planned for a reason. Those are on the roadmap for a reason. Uh, when this happens, the teams still need to get some things done. There's been promises made uh, to a customer, internal, external. So unplanned work is chronically fast-tracked, and you end up with these very frequent scope changes, which makes everything much worse. So mistreatments are just push even more work to teams, suggest people get better at multitasking or handling multiple things at once. Uh, it just doesn't work, and the numbers show that. The treatment plan is stop starting and start finishing. So just giving the teams a chance to finish their work, to take down that work in progress will improve velocity. And you'll actually see that in the flow metrics. You'll see the flow velocity improvements. Uh, enforcing WIP limits, the so work in progress limits, or putting in place a pull model. And of course, the key thing is adding capacity to the most under-resourced constraints. When you do that, everything accelerates, uh, everyone gets happier. The checkups, the monthly checkups, uh, are improved flow velocity, improved flow efficiency. And this really key one is better predictability that more of the work that's coming in is actually going to be getting done. More of what was uh, committed to that release is getting done. So, uh, and of course, when you get this, uh, in terms of the unicorn project ideals, which I like channeling here, uh, this is this, this putting that uh, improvement of daily work as part of your processes, as part of your planning, as part of every single time that you do a sprint review, every single time you do a release plan, uh, make a flow metric a, a goal as well. So of course there's roadmap items to take uh, off the roadmap, those are important, but putting some capacity, five or 10% of the team's capacity to improvement of daily work as measured by one of the flow metrics will actually have you deliver oftentimes more for even that particular release cycle and especially more for the next one. So it's just such a key balance to get teams to that focus flow and joy. So, uh, the next uh, flow diagnostic I'm going to give you is called is the workflow obscurity diagnostic, and this is a this is a slightly more nuanced one, but again, one that we see very often because many of you might be wondering is you know how how do you get at these flow metrics? How do you get this data? Do we you know do we just do a big big dumps or th or throw a Jira da data or Azure DevOps data in a in a data lake? And it actually turns out it's it's more complex than that, and this is why it's been hard to get meaningful flow metrics uh, across teams and across tools and across value streams, because the key thing is how that data is fundamentally is modeled and how that modeling matches the work that the teams do. And of course, the interesting thing is different teams actually will have different workflows and different value streams will have different workflows. Some complex value streams will actually, you know, they will have more uh, waterfall processes. Let's say that you're doing a lot of cyber physical systems, or you know, we've got a lot of customers who've deployed framework uh, for software that's running on, on cars on, or on things that fly. And of course, there are different kinds of constraints to the way that different teams work, but we can always get those flow metrics across those value streams by, by modeling that work and how, how accurate that flow modeling is uh, and how effective that flow modeling is, is key. So now if, with the flow modeling, the, in the end, this is all around the theme of making work visible and, uh, and how we make that work visible and then how we use that to drive decisions is what's so important. So oftentimes what's interesting is the, those work, workflows are obscure. So let me show you uh, another interesting diagnostic over here that, that speaks some to that. So 
in this case, the patient is a health insurance company. And the, uh, a little bit ironic, there's a lot of health insurance going on here, but we, we, you know, of course we, we see this frequently uh, because anywhere complex software is built, we have these kinds of challenges with, with flow and with DevOps and agile principles at, at scale. Another fairly mature agile deployment. Interestingly, they've had a, a successful shift from project to product. So they understand their, their uh, product portfolio quite well, and they've got that model and well-defined. Now I should mention that you can start tracking flow metrics on the most waterfall of value streams. So the flow metrics don't depend on you having shifted from project to product. They actually will help you make the case for shifting from project to product. They'll help you make the case for more investment in your, in your DevOps uh, and your delivery pipeline. Uh, uh, make the case for more business agility. In this case, there's actually been a, an organizational shift from project to product. However, the, there's an interesting set of ailments. So the, there's, the, there's a sense that development and the dev teams are moving fast, but still you know, not enough business res results are being delivered. So let's take a look at what's going on here. And by now you've kind of got a sense for the flow load chart, that work in progress chart. And what you see here is that this set of teams has over a thousand things in their flow load chart. When I first saw this, and I was actually with the, um, with the executive who's overseeing these, uh, the, you know, in this case, there's several thousand developers across their value streams. But on this particular team, this is, a, this is just several teams. Uh, and and this, this was quite surprising to me. So because on average, and it looks like a, obviously the green is a ton of feature work, what we're seeing is over a thousand uh, active uh, flow items, most of which are features. That are being worked on. So, so something feels actually quite a bit wrong here because if you're working on a thousand things concurrently, you've got you've got some challenges. And we were seeing this, by the way, almost instantly. This is only just a couple weeks of data, and we were able to, to see what's going on. So now, if we analyze the load, something odd is going on here because it looks like uh, the definition of done, and of course, the flow framework has these flow states. The definition of done is critical, and it looks like done doesn't quite mean done here. So this is, uh, if you think back to the start of the presentation, when I was telling you about flow time and how it works, uh, specifying and specifying how it works in the actual end tools that a team is using, what done means is critical because we have to take that ideal of customer focus and we have to, have to specify what done is based on the customer's point of view, not based on our internal point of view. Of course, you can have internal customers, but in that case, it's, it's not based on the development team's point of view. And what was actually happening here, what we saw very quickly and brought up on the screen is that uh, teams were setting a workflow state of done when they were done working with it and when they were, they were done development, but not when the work was delivered. So if we simply changed that workflow state, and this is, this is where you actually see flow modeling in action. If we simply change the workflow state that's in the Agile tool uh, to basically done being implemented, um, and then, but when development is done and it's, it's not actually yet been deployed, it's actually in a waiting state, which is an accurate representation of the customer's point of view, even though of course the, the dev teams need these, these multiple work states, we now see something very different because all the data instantly gets reprocessed and we actually see that there only, the flow is only 260 and that the team does not have this massive backlog of features, right? What was happening is that they were, they were being blamed, in fact, for having this big backlog of features that wasn't being done, but instead they had actually never represented their work accurately to the rest of the organization. So it looked like they were, or, or the work was being stuck. They were not. Uh, they were actually taking down their feature work very quickly. Their load was low and uh, in terms of uh, outstanding feature work. And they were actually uh, implementing those features quickly, but those features were getting stuck further down the delivery pipeline. And it's actually with a lack of, um, in this case, interestingly, uh, DevOps and environment and infrastructure support. So this is a classic example of workflow obscurity where there is not a consistent organizational view of how work is flowing through the value stream because things are obscured through some of these workflows that different teams use differently, that the ops team was actually using very differently from the, from the agile development teams. So the bottleneck was hidden uh, and development was being blamed. The flow symptoms is, and this is a one that we often see is the flow load is artificially high. Sometimes we'll also see an interesting one where flow efficiency is artificially high because the weight states have not properly been modeled. And it looks like work is always flowing, whereas it's actually blocked a lot of the time. So you're seeing these artificially high flow metrics, uh, but the business results are not improving because something is obscure about where those bottlenecks are. Business symptoms, of course, there's a perceived lack of innovation and of delivery. 
um, the constraints are, are not known. So again, uh, the, the key thing that we all need to answer is where's the bottleneck? No one can quite answer because it's not visible. And there's this other really interesting aspect to this, which is that, by the way, uh, Dominica de Grandis, the author of Making Work Visible and I, uh, we had a, quite a long and interesting chat on this on, on the Project to Product podcast, uh, where you can look that up on projecttoproduct.org on how important actually psychological safety is to this. Because if the teams are always, they always feel like anytime they, they make work visible, uh, they get scrutinized in, in odd ways. Well, they might actually hide some of that work. Whereas in hiding that work, as we see from this example, is actually causing them to get blamed. It's causing, it was causing the dev team to get blamed that they were the ones where work was being stuck. And that was simply not the case. So it's just a, it's a very self-defeating thing that came from a lack of psychological safety. So mistreatments is just to keep silos as silos and keep saying, okay, well, you know, the things get stuck here, things get stuck here. Whereas instead, of course, the interesting problems are across the silos. And we need to, the whole point of managing and measuring value streams is to be able to have that view across silos and to fix problems across those silos. So the treatment plan here was to shift from the way that things were being measured from this team focus, the silo focus to a customer focus, not to call things done until we're done for the customer. Uh, to identify the handoffs, because fundamentally this was a problem between the classic problem uh, between a dev and an ops handoff, uh, where the dev team was again calling things done, but but they were never delivered. Uh, and then of course, so to include all those cross silo handoffs and manual processes is a part of the treatment, because in the end the hypothesis then is okay. Let's look at where things are getting stuck. Why are we waiting so long for those environments? Why you know why did we call it done and it hasn't been delivered for another three or four weeks? Uh, and the checkups, of course, is to dramatically reduce flow time, because if we're looking at problem solving across those silos, uh, we should be able to very quickly look at, okay, if we can just get, I don't know, some uh, control for the development team for uh, deploying their own software, doing their own DevOps and the like, uh, basically, you know, operating what, what they create, all of a sudden, and with the support, of course, of the platform the teams and the operations teams, all of a sudden things can go, you know, you can cut out two, three, four weeks out of your flow time, which is super meaningful for everybody. Um, of course, the key thing is to always make those bottlenecks visible. So flow efficiency doesn't properly work until you've modeled your wait states. And the wait states are always there. The teams are actually, uh, agile teams like to set things in the block state so that they can actually, you know, they know when it's not something they can work on until there's an update on that particular issue or that work item. And in the checkups, of course, when, you, when you're doing this, customer satisfaction need, should increase because so much more is delivered to the customer so much more quickly. So. Uh, the, in terms of the unicorn project ideals from Gene, uh, this basically making sure that the way that you're looking at your value streams has a customer focus. Uh, that's what product value streams are all about. They're about the customer and actually including that psychological safety so that bottlenecks are surface. And of course, when they surface, we're able to solve them. And again, keep in mind that, that with value streams, uh, it, it's almost always the dependencies across functions, across silos, oftentimes the dependencies between value streams, as we saw in that first example, that are the main problems that we want to solve. So uh, in this case, the, you know, what was so fascinating about this is that by making this visible, uh, the, the quote from the executive here was that we were able to, for the first time, get resources allocated to us outside of the budging cycle based on taking this live data to our CIO. Because, of course, everyone wants to fix these bottlenecks and deliver more value to customers more quickly. So the, the neat thing is then how all of these things are put together. Because what's happening is as you've got these kinds of um, bottlenecks, connect, bottlenecks visible, flow visible. The key thing is how you actually connect them to business outcomes and business results. So here's another example uh, that's, a, that's a fairly recent, recent one that I think is a, is, is, is a great one to illustrate. So here you've got a team who's been actually creating uh, some one of the internal platforms. And one of the things that I think is really important to understand is in the shift from project to product is that uh, only a, typically only a portion of your product portfolio is actually an external products. So those are the products that, that go to customers. Uh, enterprises tend to have a really large portion, but you know, tech companies as well, of the products that they build, be the, their, their internal products, be the platforms and APIs and analytics pipelines and the like, and SDKs that you're creating and, and these kinds of things inter to be consumed internally, sometimes to be consumed by partners. 
So in this case, this organization is, uh, they're actually undergoing a, a, a shift to cloud. They're bringing much of their portfolio to cloud and really creating those cloud platforms. Now, what happened here is in that shift to cloud, there was a focus on moving things to cloud uh, very quickly, as you can imagine, uh, proving this out. And as part of that, uh, that tech debts, you know, those tech debt stories come up again. It's, it's, it's a kind of an amazing thing when, you know, you've just spent time as is from that first flow diagnostic that you saw the tech debt death spiral, you've just spent all this time, you know, let's say uh, breaking apart an, an internal on-premise application that runs in a data center, you now shift to cloud. There's a lot of organizational pressure to, to move to cloud. And of course the teams end up taking a whole bunch of shortcuts to actually get the customer data, the different views that they need um, into in, uh, into cloud services. And as you're doing that, guess what? Chances are you're not gonna make uh, the most optimal use of storage services and the different services that Amazon or Azure or, or Google Cloud provide you uh, for, for managing storage of large data. And that is exactly what happened to this team. So in that push to clouds, even though this was you know, effectively you know, more of a greenfield uh, application than we've seen previously, uh, they moved quickly and their hosting costs ballooned. And what we see here, of course, is, and by the way, the, the, what we see here is, uh, if we look at the middle chart, this is the, their investment technical debt. The team, as part of the regular planning cadence, stated, okay, look, we can keep implementing all of these different services that we need for, for our other teams, our mobile and web and uh, applications and analytics teams internally to leverage these features, or we can spend some time, this particular release cycle, investing in tech debt reduction. And if we don't do that, those costs that we're so concerned about in the cloud, they're just going to keep going up. But their hypothesis was uh, that if we actually start using the storage services available to us, and we actually start optimizing some of the storage services that we're using, our costs will actually go down. And this is, this is exactly what happened, that cost bubble that they created. We can see here over the course of uh, sometime in the summer, their flow velocity was very much focused on tech debt. And the way that tech debt was measured by, in this case, previously I gave you the example of tech debt being measured by uh, flow velocity improvement. In this case, that tech debt was actually measured by hosting costs. And they actually saw over two thirds of their hosting bill get reduced because they made smarter use of, of storage services. And this is really that magic of the, flow, of the flow metrics and the flow distribution. It allows you to make an economic case for why invest in platforms, why invest in APIs, why invest in, in making better use of existing services, rolling some of your own services in some cases. Uh, and in this case, for a very clear economic outcome of actually very significantly reduced costs. So the key thing is, uh, as, as you know, we continue to look at what the, how to best deliver on business outcomes, best deliver on custom met metrics, such as net promoter score or uh, customer retention or active usage, to use the flow metrics as a leading indicator of that investment. So we just accelerate feature velocity. Therefore, we expect our customer net promoter scores to improve uh, because we were able to deliver so much more of those features that delight our customers. And so seeing all of this together actually makes it very, so much easier to collaborate between, again, uh, people close to the customer, people closer to development, to infrastructure, and to get everyone on the same page across all of those silos. And really the key thing is that rather than kind of having this, you know, uh, uh, no consistent view of our portfolios, we're always seeing the bottlenecks of our portfolios. We're always seeing exactly what the flow distribution is for every single release that we're planning. And then we're seeing what it is after when we're doing our retrospectives. Uh, we're seeing the flow time and we have a sense what, for what the forecast of flow time would be, but also what the actual flow time is and how it's changing over time. And of course, the most important thing is where things get stuck, where things are waiting and where we can apply the principles of DevOps to accelerate things. So in terms of the conclusion, uh, keep in mind that Changing a system from, resist, from within the system is, is basically impossible. These are some of the things that, that Deming taught us. We need to take a view from outside the system. We need to be able to measure outside these value streams. Expecting our teams to fix these problems just by looking at their backlogs and burndown charts won't work. We need to measure across value streams, across those silos. That's where the problems are, across the various tools and processes that we have. And oftentimes, actually, across multiple value streams and across teams because of how problematic those bottlenecks become. Uh, Another key point that's, that can be a little bit nuanced is that we've got in, in value streams and software, we've got some very complex dynamics. 
So basically using absolute values to say, well, you know, we expect our feature delivery to be 65.2%. It, it doesn't quite work. Uh, what you want to do is basically understand your trends first, and then from that derive some common practices. So for example, you want to see your flow time get reduced. And we know that flow time measured in days is drives innovation you know, much faster than flow time that's measured in weeks, because of course you're establishing that feedback loop between your customer and your software development and, and what you deliver. So the key thing is to initially at least only focus on how things are improving, only focus on uh, flow time reduction, only focus on the flow velocity improvement and how you're actually go going to achieve those. Uh, now, of course, you know, our, our Flow Advisor as a task app will tell you that uh, flow efficiency of 10% is a whole lot worse than the flow efficiency of, of 60%. And, and we do like to see our customers go to flow efficiencies uh, over uh, well over 50% by removing those bottlenecks. But of course, again, you can track that directionally. And we are starting to build up this, this body of best practices. But I think the key thing is do avoid the pitfalls of saying every value stream needs to spend 20% of their time on tech debt. Because some may need to spend more, and some may actually need to spend less, and some may defer that tech that investment until they've they've done their next uh, you know major release or or, or first uh, first release of some major new functionality. Um, and I, the key thing is is uh, to me is to actually you know, help leaders get involved and engaged in the measurement of these metrics. Help leaders understand why technical debt is important, why WIP and flow load is so bad. And that's really the goal of the flow framework to give us, give us a common language for these concepts that I think uh, a lot of us as, as developers and technologists understand innately, but that are, are less familiar to business leaders making these, in, these investments and fundamentally are determining how we're managing teams and processes and, and the organization across value streams and across silos. So I think the key thing is uh, you know, one of the best practices I've seen is to put a flow efficiency uh, target as part of your OKRs, objectives and key results, as part of your planning as an annual and a quarterly goal. That will help everyone on the business side, uh, on the technology side, be basically get in the same boat around that continuous improvement and applying some effort from each, every single release, every single quarter to how we improve. And of course, this, you know, beyond the, uh, the development teams, as, as so often that we see these bottlenecks coming from upstream of the teams with things like canceled work, things like too much work in progress being pushed on the teams. And so really use those, the flow metrics to make that economic case of why invest in tech debt, because it will reduce our costs. It will accelerate our delivery down the road. Um, why invest in risk reduction and why we need to keep a, a balance of these flow items and, and always keep that focus on flow distribution. Um, so with that, you can learn more on the project to project.org. Uh, my podcast is there. Flowframework.org has the Flow Institute now as well. We can some great free materials on, uh, on, on uh, learning the flow framework on measuring flow. And then uh, you can uh, reach out to me here on uh, mpersonatastop.com and learn more about our solutions around uh, the flow framework and some of these, these, these insights that we got from our customers and how to deliver value to those customers on, on tastop.com. And um, keep in mind that all author proceeds uh, from the Project to Project book go to supporting charitable programs for women and minorities in technology. So with that, uh, thank you very much, and I look forward to hearing from you.